Thank you, yeah, thank you for having me. So, um, I'm uh, Luis, working um, with Shadow Network. Um, it's a project incubated by um, BrainBot, which is an older sort of software development company in the Ethereum space. Um, and I'll be talking um, about MEV, the user impact that, um, that MEV has, and then, and then later I'll also talk more in practice of how we can maybe um, help uh, mitigate it by encrypting the mempool and encryption. Yeah, All right. Okay, I mean, where it is. <laughs> um, so maybe to preface, we we really like, um, we love base layer neutrality, and we love um, sustainable market architecture, right? And um, this is this prefaces what we what I'll be talking to um, about, and um, and maybe to say something as well as as also we think that it relates to accessibility. So if your base layer is neutral and if your base layer treats everyone the same, sort of, and, and there's information symmetry, then we think we can increase accessibility, which is um, sort of, I think, a really important goal um, for, for, for everyone working in, in, in on-chain, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little more on this, right, on this problem-solution set is, um, I think in the rec recent years, um, mainstream uh, and reg regulation has really been hostile towards crypto. Um, I think the, the perception is that it's really uh, an unsustainable market environment from the outside. People don't think it is intransparent, um, even though we're all about transparency, right? But it, from the outside, it looks hostile and um, really um, sort of all these Ponzi's, front running, just a not, not a nice marketplace, right, from the outside. Um, so again, I think via base, base neutrality, via sort of um, increasing accessibility um, and a more sustainable market architecture, hoping to get back, to bring this back, and to bring back um, sort of mainstream um, appreciation of crypto. Um, more specifically, so the, before I was talking about the more general topic of crypto is broken and hostile, but what we are more about is sort of this transaction supply chain, and we think it's in a bad state in general. So, so we think it really front-running malicious MEV causes um, the, this measurable direct um, user losses. Um, the, the larger issue behind this, though, we think is it deters new entrants or deters serious investors from, from entering the market. And indirectly, by, by sort of quick fixing the, the MEV and transaction supply chain, we are um, creating these centralization vectors. So we're, we're, we're fixing it and we're mitigating some of the issues, but usually we fix it in a way where we're then adding another intermediary um, and someone w which then can censor again or can... Um, uh, it's a centralization force, uh, entrenching this, these actors. Um, so that was just the motivation, but maybe st taking some, one step back, as maybe people are not familiar, what is, what is front-running and what is MEV? Um, so front-running is very simple. Is you're jumping the queue, essentially. You're, you're, you have some information advantage. You jump in front of another person's trade, and you steal that person's trade, thus sort of harming that other person because that, that person's getting a, a, a worse price. MEV is sort of the, the umbrella term, it's called maximal uh, extractable value, and um, front-running is just one part of this, so there is actually also non-front-running non related MEV, so we're generally speaking about back-running related MEV, arbitrage, liquidations, and those are generally considered to be benign neutral, so we are not even want to get rid of this, essentially. Um, and one thing to note is it's illegal, the front-running is illegal in the, in the real world, in crypto, it's considered harmful and, um, and detrimental to user experience. Um, so, so, as I said, we're first sort of talking about the MEV user impact, and the way um, we are talking about this is uh, my colleague Yannick um, built this model um, to simulate diff the user um, impact on user trading performance, um, simulating as a, based on variant, ver different transaction ordering strategies. Um, so, what do we want to show here? How, again, how do various transaction ordering strategies impact the user performance? Which one is the best, uh, the quote-unquote best? Um, and one thing to note is, yeah, caveat or disclaimer, it's really a very simple model and just a, so it's more, more considered more like a mental model of how, how it works rather than a real world sort of like cat-cat um, simulation of what would actually happen. Um, so what's under the hood is, there's a, the, the assumption is there's just one AMM with one single pool. Users are buying and selling, prices moving up and down. 
in the sequence I can either sort of reorder, arbitrage, or inject their own orders. So yeah, that's this model. First, the first um, strategy, transaction ordering strategy, would be uh, a random ordering, um, fully randomly ordered, which is um, uh, unrealistic because yeah, this people do see these arbitrage opportunities and they will try to exploit it. But um, in this case, there would be zero user loss, um, which would be nice. Uh, however, also the price would be uh, maybe not really true to the market price because this would be very random sort of, right? Again, not really realistic um, because yeah, we have people looking for arbitrage opportunities. This next strategy would be the random ordering, but there is arbitrage. So the um, sequencer can take uh, an arbitrage opportunity after every block. Um, and we see the interesting here, part here is the, there's a lot, lot, lot uh, less user loss. Um, so you're seeing sort of, um, yeah, so the, the, the user loss is, is a lot, uh, um, so, so no, there is, um, there is a minimal user loss compared to the first one. However, the price is more true to the real price. Uh, the, the, it, it's fluctuating less and we have a, yeah. Um, comparing it to random ordering, but then there is an arbitrage after every transaction. So the, before we had after the block, here it's after every transaction. This um, increase, significantly increases the user loss, uh, and also and the price is um, slightly more close to the real price. Uh, and it's pretty inefficient because we have these back-running transactions after every order, right? So uh, it's kind of inefficient. Um, but, but yes, there is, um, yeah, and there's more user loss. Um, this one is a, one step even more, sort of it's the uh, sequencer is trying to really maximize um, its, uh, the, the back running. So he's arbitraging um, after every block, but he's also reordering transactions to, to yeah, again, maximize his profit, um, which that increases user losses a lot more, um, again. Uh, yeah, and then the, the price is going to be always the same sort of, yeah? And this one is the most extreme form of the sequencer sandwiches every single trade, the front runs and back, back runs essentially, and that really increases, that really maximizes the user loss. So that's something, I think everyone sort of agrees we don't want this, right? And then we're, I would say generally speaking, people maybe are somewhere on the spectrum of somewhere in here, right, where they think it's ideal. Um, and sort of our takeaways from this, we think sandwiching, again, is the most detrimental um, strategy. And um, even simple reordering can actually have uh, impact and, and, and negative impacts. Um, so what we're sort of looking at a little bit is um, we think that the random ordering with arbitrage um, version, so it's um, this, um, we think is the best trade-off. So that has the, the, the price is pretty true to the real price. We have minimal user loss. Um, so we have arbitrage, we have no front running, so we think this is sort of, as we currently look at it, it's probably the best kind of trade-off, right? Um, yeah, just some caveats. Um, the model uh, is pretty uninformed, random, there's a results in a zero-sum model. The, we were assuming this maximally simplified world, uh, and, and it's just illustrative. I, th I think I said this before, yeah? Um, but sort of taking this and saying, okay, maybe this, this strategy um, maybe some variation of the strategy is is probably the the best outcome for everyone for for the sort of the the the, the health of the marketplace. With this in mind, we think we can create a more MEV aware uh, where protocol infrastructure, and and especially sort of one example of this that we're working on uh, we call um, that we, what we call Shutter is this encryption of the mempool. So it's a threshold encryption um, technology to encrypt the mempool and prevent especially front running. So yeah. um, how does it work? So transactions are encrypted, batched and signed while still encrypted. So the, the, the block proposer um, cannot see what's in the transactions so they can't really censor or front run. And then we're using threshold encryption to uh, remove the, the need for trust and to decentralize the encryption decryption role. Right? So we have these keepers that are running the DKG they are collaborating to generate encryption keys and then decryption keys, and that plugs into other protocol infrastructure. So we have to, ideally, it needs to, um, to deeply integrate with, an, with a blockchain or rollup, and it needs to be a protocol level change. Um, 
So, and, but if we do this, if we encrypt the mempool again, then we can, uh, the, the sequencer or block, produce, block producer can't really see what's in transactions, can't front run. And we think this really results in this quasi-random ordering with arbitrage. As I said before, this is probably the, the most attractive strategy. Um, and generally speaking, this increased information symmetry, we think, leads to these direct benefits for users of safer trading, no front running. In um, the, this also, I mean, if it's, you get front run less, then you also get better prices, so you just have a more profitable trading experience, essentially. And we're adding this type of real-time censorship resistance because, yeah, if you don't know what you're sort of committing to, you uh, can't really censor based on the content of the transactions. Um, so these are the benefits for users, um, but you could argue that there is kind of um, the validators or sequencers, they're getting restricted, right? They, they, ha they now have to commit to um, shielded or encrypted transactions so in a way, they're restricting them, them, themselves. So you could argue that they actually have less power and they can extract less MEV. Um, however, we actually think there's also some benefits there for them. So, so one is really this image, right? And you, sort of the, the positive image you're projecting and saying this infrastructure, this protocol is actually a more safe and healthy trading environment. Um, we think that'll, that could really have the benefit, again, bringing in, back in um, more serious and more Cash, more mainstream investors, um, and then also, and then by this, increasing the overall revenue again. Um, the other benefits we think are really sort of in the, in the realm of regulatory benefits a little bit. So if you can front run, if you can extract MEV from the outside, this looks a little bit more like a financial intermediary because you're, yeah, you're sort of, th this power is like an unnatural power, and if you're arguing with the regulator, what, how should you be regulated as a validator or as a sequencer. Ideally, you want to make the case that you are a purely technical provider and not a financial intermediary who can extract value, right? So, so we think by being able to argue that there is no way for you even technically to extract front-running related MEV, that then you have a better argument of plausible de deniability of saying, okay, um, well, we couldn't even front-run, so please, we should be regulated like a, a technical provider rather than like a financial intermediary. And we're seeing actually some regulators around the world, Mika and, and Bank, of, Bank of International Settlement, they are making statements towards um, also making front-running illegal, in the, like it is in TradFi, also making it illegal for crypto, right? So, um, and all, and in general speaking, the, the, the sequencer especially can still um, collect and distribute back-running related MEV. So there's still this arbitrage, um, aspect to it. Shutter, um, we're working on different integrations. So Shutter itself is um, finished, the DKG, but we are um, implementing it into different um, other protocols. So the one that is actually already live and providing um, shielded voting um, and, and running live is in Snapshot, which is, um, there is actually not the MEV use case, but we're encrypting the real-time results during the vote which we think ha that helps with information symmetry. And we have over 200,000 shielded votes cast, and this is just chugging along. I think it's working very well, snapshot. And that's, we're thinking that this is actually the more natural and more the normal way of voting, right? To have a shielded, uh, to have shielded voting. Um, then what I'll talking about more detail later, we're, we're currently working really with the Gnosis chain to implement it into the Gnosis chain. Um, and we're also uh, working on this, um, uh, essentially uh, uh, optimism grant to, pro to explore how to implement an encrypted mempool for OP stack based rollups. And there we have the requirements and architecture ready and just sort of next steps would be, yeah, actually building it um, for the OP stack. Um, yeah, and the Shutterized Gnosis chain, again, is this collaboration with Gnosis chain. They have a very similar vision on this. Martin um, is talking about this uh, um, frequently on Twitter or in interviews. And yeah, all the benefits I said before, new, more neutral base layer, um, censorship resistance, um, MEV res front running resistance, that's, that's what, what this is about. We have this practical kind of accelerated roadmap where we first build it as an opt-in kind of soft fork variant. Um, and yeah, we think that it'll be a nice sort of first example and reference implementation of this yeah, idea, which then can be looked upon by other and, and copied by other L2s or Ethereum, even Ethereum L1 itself. Um, 
Roughly speaking, this is sort of our technical architecture. Um, we sort of roughly explaining how it works is the keepers generate first this Eon key, which that is um, broadcasted to the, that is um, passed on to the key broadcast contract. Um, the users are using this key to derive um, individual transaction encryption keys, which they use to actually encrypt every single transaction in our current design. They pass on these encrypted transactions to the sequencer contract. That's where they sort of are just deposited. Um, proposer listens for those um, transactions and, and then um, uh, uses, uses them to, um, yeah, to then ultimately build the block and propose the block. And something I forgot to say in between is essentially by sending it to the sequencer contract, that's what fixes the order of the transactions in place. By them being in the sequencer contract, that says, okay, now they are in this order, do they need to be executed? Um, and this is a nice way to also separate, so sort of saying uh, the proposer no longer really has even the ability to order transactions because the order is already fixed in place while they're still encrypted. Um, and then, yeah, and then at the end, keepers generate the decryption keys Proposer is using the decryption keys to, to, uh, to decrypt and then, again, propose the block. Um, yeah, and the one, the one nice thing uh, is really the, this Eon and key derivation method, which saves the step of not having to generate encryption keys every, uh, every transaction and, or every block. So this is, saves a lot of um, overhead as well, but yeah. Um, Generally speaking, yeah, again, we're taking this pretty practical approach, this opt-in kind of soft fork approach. There's another sort of little shortcut that we're taking in the, in the initially, which is that the RPC provider actually encrypts uh, the transactions, which not really optimal, right? Then you're trusting, again, the RPC provider, but this allows us just to go to market quicker. Uh, and then the next step would be this deeper enforcement of rules and, and an actual hard fork to be able to slash and everything, um, yeah. Again, collaborative effort working on this in this try sort of set up with Nethermind team and the Gnosis team. Um, comparing it to other approaches, so this is not the only uh, way to encrypt the mempool or the only way to sort of introduce some kind of front running protection, right? Some other alternatives are to, yeah, just have the RPC uh, protect against MEV on the RPC level, which good, good quick fix, we would say. But then again, what I said in the very beginning, we are introducing this reliance on centralized intermediaries um, and I introducing another censorship vector and trust vector, centralization vector. So not really a long-term solution in our, in our opinion. Um, you can use um, things uh, that trusted execution environments like SGX, but yeah, you're trusting then a little bit in a chip manufacturer and, and there are um, vulnerabilities um, with this. Um, there is the, there's other approaches using verifiable delay function sort of type of approaches, which um, that, that would then require these custom ASICs, and, and there's also some design challenges because that's really a time sensitive thing. And yeah, again, this is this hardware, a uh, little bit of a trust in the hardware um, there, right? Um, super interesting and, and something we're looking at quite closely is sort of MPC, FHE, this really advanced type of cryptography, which would ultimately have the, um, ability probably to make the entire, um, to make everything encrypted and just operate on encrypted transactions and then we can solve everything, right? And also solve privacy and everything. But um, that's really not really practic practical right now. It's not, not, not cost effective, uh, not even close to be cost effective. But yeah, super interesting to look at in the future and maybe co incorporating small parts of it, um, MPC for example. Yeah. In effect, the threshold encryption approach at Shutter that we're employing is a very simple um, one specific instance of MPC, right? So we are in, on that track um, already. Um, so we talked about uh, sh the Shutterized Gnosis chain, which is this implementation for an L1 or like a beacon chain type of uh, Ethereum chain, right? Um, but we're also, again, building it for L2s. Um, and there, uh, there's another, in addition to all the benefits of censorship resistance, front running resistance, um, uh, also front, in addition to the front running resistance, there's also this, um, interesting way to look at it in relation to the sequencer decentralization roadmaps. So in, in a way, with the encryption, um, encrypted mempool, you can reap most of the benefits of a decentralized sequencer, which is especially this 
real-time and strong censorship resistance um, without actually having to decentralize. So, so this could actually op open sort of the, um, the ability or the, the optionality for rollups to, yeah, to have this alternative sequencer decentralization roadmap. Um, and, and this setup then we think has a has in overall then has a actually improved latency yeah because you still have the centralized infrastructure you still have all the benefits of less complexity and less sort of overhead communication overhead and decentralization um, so we think it could have actually have um, improved latency over this decentralized sequence setup while still being kind of strongly real time censorship resistant um, and yeah again I said this already I think um, the the shutter uh, the L2 sequencers would still have the ability to extract and um, distribute backrunning related MEV. So that's not impacted by this at all. Yeah. Um, and then beyond this a little bit, what we're working right now uh, on is we're also looking into yeah, these other hot topics, I would say, in MEV. Right? Shared sequencing, intense OFAs. Uh, how does an encrypted mempool combine with these? Right? Especially um, super interesting, I would say, in, in the intense case where Initially, you would say that an intense-based trading narrative is is kind of a different, kind of the opposite approach to something like Shutter, because in the intense, in this intense vision, you are revealing a lot of information about your trade beforehand in order to find a better, uh, so in order for solvers to find a better solution. Whereas Shutter, the idea is you're not revealing anything, right? Because you want to be protected against um, that. Um, however, we think it actually works quite well together. Either in a way we think it would make sense to really make it transparent what information you re reveal, right? So, so, so being able to, for the user to decide, I, I now want to voluntarily reveal information um, f for this part of the transactions, but for this other, I don't, right? So these combinations and making it more transparent and giving the user the option of revealing or not revealing. Um, but also, just uh, later in the, in, the, in, the, in the transaction supply chain, in the intense based transaction supply chain, um, you have the issue again. You have then solvers or solver builders creating these, solve, these matched kind of intents and they're, and they're, they're building the, 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 these partial blocks, right? And then they don't want to get front run again from other solvers, for example, right? So, so then we would say at this point, you would probably, you would probably have to benefit again from some, some sort of... Um, commit reveal or shutter, shutter DKG type of system later in the transaction supply chain. Um, yeah, and for auto flow auctions, we think it combines nicely. Generally speaking, shutter reduces the MEV and reduces the front running or minimizes it and then using OFAs to distribute and kind of distribute uh, the remainder of the, the MEV. Right? Um, and that's sort of it. Uh, again, sort of the, the gist of it, we're trying to build a more sustainable market architecture, um, trying to bring more fairness, accessibility to, to um, on-chain use cases. Um, and especially if you're building a roll-up yourself or have a DeFi sort of front-running um, prone DAP, um, we'd love to get in touch. Uh, and, and again, talking about MEV, also more generally speaking about, about sequencer decentralization, we're super interested in this also, also apart from also more generally speaking, apart from the encrypted mempool and shutter. So yeah, would love to get in touch and yeah, follow us on Twitter. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Luis. Uh, does anyone, anyone have any questions? We have some more time. Uh, how, are you, how will you do uh, liquidations and arbitrage uh, if you encrypt the mempool? Yeah, good question, yeah. So without going into the actual deep details, the, the simple way of answering is the way Shutter works, or the, this type of encryption works, uh, it can only prevent front-running related MEV, because essentially you're, it, the easiest way to explain it with the sequencer, the sequencer um, can, the, the sequencer receives encrypted transactions and the order of the transactions is fixed in place, right? Uh, so they can't put transactions sort of before this, but then they are the first ones and they have the order, they have the, the power then to um, decrypt and then to put transactions immediately after, in a way, right? So they can then extract all the backrunning related MEV. Does that make sense? So, so, so they can't front run because 
the order is in place of the transactions that are there, but then they have the power to, to put transactions afterwards because they're still the sequencer, right? They still have the, they still have the, the overall transaction ordering um, power. But the sequencer does not know what's inside your transaction, yes? Yeah. So, so how can... can well, then they, then they know, right? It's, it's revealed, right? So, so it's a, Shutter is a, a commit and reveal scheme, and then it's decrypted, and the, the sequencer reveals. The, he, he's the one who's, ah. who receives the key from the keep from the Shutter system, and then they're the ones being able to decrypt. They're the first ones who see everything, essentially. Um, uh, and they're the ones who are able then to yeah, put transactions immediately afterwards. They can't change the order, but they can then put them right afterwards. So they... Okay, there's a um, defined ordering, and they put transactions at the end of the block, or something like that. Yes, or in a separate. Um, maybe Yannick, can you can you explain on this? <laughs> oh, you don't have a microphone. Yes. Um, yes, basically. So so after the transaction uh, transactions are decrypted, then they know the state, then they see which arbitrage opportunities are there and which um, which liquidations are possible, and then basically in the um, um, uh, yeah, basically at the, in the next block in the beginning they can put uh, whatever they like in there. Great. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, does this approach what the Sutter has, uh, does it have any uh, uh, downsides? Uh, on the obvious downside of being being more complex, like does it does it impact the user like normal retail user anyway? Yeah, yeah. Two main two main sort of downsides we would say. One is a slightly increased cost. So this this process costs a little money. You know the generation of keys. So there would be a small sort of additional transaction fee attached to it that goes to primarily to the shutter keepers. Um, but we think that'll be offset by, again, people not getting front run, so you'll then have better prices, and overall, the economics uh, need, to, need to be worked out in a way, and they will, I think, be easily worked out in a way that um, the transaction fee is smaller than the expected loss from not getting front run, right? Uh, and it's quite easy because, yeah, the, the losses are pretty huge, so we think it's, it's going to be quite economical uh, to, to map, to model this, yeah, especially for larger transactions. Um, and then the other trade-off is to do with latency. So this, this encryption decryption um, takes a little bit of time, a couple of seconds, essentially. So depending on how you look at it, this is like added to it, or in, 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 the, in the L1 case, it's, it can be even parallelized with some of, some of the other sort of block production process. But if you compare for the sequencer, for the L2 case, um, because the current user experience on L2s is you get this instant transaction inclusion and, and transaction um, uh, result immediately. So there it would, yeah, it would, def it would increase the execution latency by a couple of seconds while still having this instant transaction inclusion latency. So you would get the result immediately. Uh, sorry, you would get the transaction inclusion receipt immediately that your transaction will definitely be included. And then a couple of seconds afterwards you would get the uh, result of transaction, so that, yeah. So, two trade-off costs and the other one latency, but we think, again, the latency is actually not really that of a problem, depending on what your preference is, but we think it should be, for normal trades, it should be very acceptable to wait a couple of seconds, right? You're, yeah, so maybe if you're a high-frequency trader, you're not really happy about this, <laughs> but, uh, but if you're a normal user who just wants to buy something, um, you more, should care more about your price um, than a couple of seconds, right? Sorry, I, I remember reading some discussion that that kind of makes the transactions that are encrypted end up, you know, being um, happening over two, two blocks because mm. you need to submit them encrypted and they have to be included in one block. Yeah. And then they, they are decrypted and only in the next block you get the, uh, the actual result, like the execution of the, so it kind of, yeah, this was an earlier design that we worked on where we built it purely on-chain as a smart contract kind of solution on top where you don't have to modify the underlying protocol. Then it would have to work like this. Then you have this first, this kind of um, first uh, shutter smart contract which then in the next block passes it on to the target smart contract. 
um, but we moved away from that design because of that downside, also other downsides, composability, cost. So in the implementing it into the protocol, um, you don't have that specific problem, but yeah, you have the increased latency, yeah? but it's just part of the block production then. Yeah? So it's not a second block, but it's, it takes a little longer. Okay, um, I think that's it. Uh, so thank you very much, Luis, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. So thanks.